and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, I check out the Transform keyboard. I play some games, have a chat to Jeff, and end with a catch up on the Spectrum next. Let's get on then. many keyboards for the Spectrum, the most popular being the DKtronics variant that I covered in episode 75. Other popular brands were the Low Profile, a really nice keyboard that I owned back in the day, and the Saga Range, again a really nice keyboard that I also owned back in the day. After that there were other less known ones like the Cheetah, the Stone Chip, and the Transform, and it is this last one, the Transform, that I happened to get hold of about six months ago. The keyboard was released around January 1984, for a not-so-cheap £69.95, with adverts boasting a whole range of features including a numeric keypad, 59 full-size keys, and the ability to incorporate Interface 1. By January 1986, the end of the product's life, the price had actually gone up to £79.95, the opposite of most peripherals. The unit I got was not in the best condition. It had been hacked about at the back because the microdrive connector seemed not to line up. It was dirty and the motherboard itself just didn't work. The motherboard though did have a spider mod which I found interesting. I covered the stripping down, cleaning and rebuilding of this on my Patreon channel and it didn't take too long to get the Spectrum motherboard fixed thanks to Mutant Caterpillar and installed back in the case. The cleaning isn't 100% complete yet but I just wanted to see if the keyboard worked. The unit itself is made of metal and is very heavy. Inside you can fit a power supply, along with some additional wiring for the large on-off switch at the side and the power light on the top. You can also get the Interface 1 inside, as advertised. To fit your Spectrum you remove the top, including the keyboard, but keep the lower case intact, and if you are using Interface 1 you can slot that in as well as normal. The power lead loops from the power supply inside the case, outside of the back and into the Spectrum's motherboard. The back of the keyboard allows access to all of the connections you'd normally have. As mentioned earlier, the side of my case had been hacked by the previous owner. At some point I may remove Interface 1 altogether and try and bend the metal plate back. But at the moment it's time to test it. With everything plugged in and turned on, the keyboard is excellent. It's a really well made piece of kit with solid keys and a really great feel to it. Playing games provide some good feedback, but obviously the improvements come when typing. Entering code from typing games is easy, and once you get used to the key layout and the additional keys like the extended mode, things are so much better. Word processing too is greatly improved, the keys feel really nice, and it's just like typing on one of those old quality clicky keyboards that you used to get with old XTPCs, if you remember that far back. Anyway, big chunky keys, yes, with a great sound too, and a great feeling. The only worrying thing for me was the power lead, because the case is metal, there is a separate ground wire that goes from the plug and it's fixed inside the case to earth it. I presume this is for safety reasons, but it does make me a little nervous. I really like this keyboard and I will get round to removing Interface 1 at some point and bending that metal thing back and of course completing the cleanup. The slight flicker you may say on the footage was due to the composite lid being a bit loose on the back of the television and nothing to do with the keyboard itself. Overall then, a really great keyboard. I think the keys are better than the DK version, but I do prefer the DKtronics case. I'm not sure about the weight or the metal that is used to build it.
This is Blood and Guts, released by Quicksilver in 1984. This is one of those games that had a name change for one reason or another. It usually involves copyright issues, but in this case, I think it seems to be the opposite. Blood and Guts was first announced in the press around November 1984, with advertisements going out in several magazines. However, in early 1985, Quicksilver changed the name to Fantastic Voyage, and claimed it was based on the film of the same name. So it would appear that they put out the game first, and then applied for the film license, and finally got it and changed the name. Either way, it's the same game, and involves being miniaturised and swimming around a human body. There is a story around a scientist being involved in a car crash, and him being the only one who knows the secret of miniaturisation. To save him, you have to fix his brain from the inside, and so off you go in your frogman's outfit, with just 60 minutes to survive and complete your task. However, your submarine is broken during the process and scattered about the body in eight pieces. You have to find these pieces and take them back to the brain to complete your mission. And the first part of the submarine can be found in the start location, so you pick this up and head off in search of the head. As you swim about, the host body may get infected, which has to be dealt with fast. These infections are shown on screen as a flashing red block, and you have to get to that part of the body as quick as you can and blast it with your laser. And it gets even more complex, as some organs have blockages, and these can only be cleared by finding white blood cells and taking them to the blockage. The graphics, as you can see, are not what you would call lifelike in any way, shape or form, with the body passages built from squares, and some of them flashing for no apparent reason. There are red blood cells floating about, and these can be collected for points. Suddenly an infection appears, and I head off to try and stop it. However, I couldn't find an actual way to get into where it was, and it took me a while to work out the game map. This is because the diagram of the body is backwards. So the main view will say, for example, you're in the left thigh, but on the diagram it's on the other side because it's reversed and looking upwards, if that sort of makes sense. If an infection is not treated quickly, the body temperature will rise, and if it gets too hot, it's game over. You can move faster by swimming rather than walking, and if you do get an infection, depending on the layout of the screen, it can be sometimes impossible to destroy it before it destroys you. The graphics are basic, really, as you can see, and I'm certainly not a fan of the blocky backgrounds. Sound is average with a few laser effects here and there, and luckily you can turn off the music if you don't like it. This is a tricky game, and one that will take a while to complete, because you have to balance getting bits of the submarine and fighting infection. This can be difficult if you are currently in the foot, and the infection appears on the shoulder, because it can take a while to get back to that part of the body. A game I will not be going back to. It just didn't do anything for me, sadly, and the blocky flashing graphics made it look terrible. Shadow of the Beast was an iconic game for the Amiga. It was breathtaking seeing it for the first time, the superb parallax graphics and brilliant music made for a very good technical demo, but many felt that's all it was, and that there wasn't actually a game in there to back it up. When it was announced for the Spectrum, most people thought it was a joke. How could such a fantastic looking game ever be converted for the Sinclair machine? Well, here is the answer. This is Shadow of the Beast released by Gremlin Graphics in 1990, two years after the original Amiga version. Arriving on two tapes, it's a huge game, and the story describes the background and informs you that your task is to fight your way to the heart of the enemy stronghold and defeat your adversary. The music is done very well, and certainly captures the flavour of the Amiga tune, considering the limitations of the AY chip. Once into the game and we get a parallax landscape, sadly in monochrome. 
The two layers move smoothly enough though, and the main character is large, with limited animation. You can crouch, punch, jump and kick, and combinations of those will produce further attacks such as a jumping kick. If you head off to the right, you'll find a well. Climbing down there gets you nowhere because at the bottom is a door that needs a key. I set off again to the right and encountered a few spider-like things which could be dealt with by a crouching punch. Eventually you'll get to some bouncing eyeballs too, and this part keeps going on for ages. Although the graphics do look great, there's a lot of repeating going on, and there are periods when you're just running about or moving between bouncing eyeballs. Eventually you'll come to a building, and entering this gives you little options as it soon gets dark if you move away from the door. Back outside then and on the wall is a torch. Grabbing that, you can head back inside. But I didn't have much luck once I got in here and died shortly afterwards. When you move from area to area, there's a lot of loading to be done, so tape owners would have spent ages waiting for the next section to load in. I also noticed that the video on YouTube shows images of each area and the description as the text scrolls along, but the electronic versions I had didn't have these. It seems then that going right is not the best idea, so I tried to head off again to the left, and it wasn't long before I found a tree that could be entered and a new level opens up. This has ladders and more enemies in the form of Axemen. Later on there's also flying serpent-like things to deal with, and if you get far enough in one direction you'll find a huge boss that's impossible to defeat without a weapon. There are a lot of different elements in this game, and it's very impressive that they managed to squeeze it all into a spectrum. The music as you play is excellent too, setting a brilliant atmosphere. The gameplay, I agree, can be repetitive, climbing, exploring, punching, but the game always challenges you to find more things. Eventually I found a smaller boss holding an orb, and after losing a few health points, stupidly, I managed to get this, and this is one of the weapons you need to be able to defeat some of the larger bosses. I can now shoot fireballs, excellent! With a bit of care and learning of the map, and how to progress, I think this will keep you busy for a while. Depending on your outlook then, this game is either a repetitive platform beat em up with interesting graphics, or a challenging game with a great atmosphere. I prefer the latter. Sangson was a sensational game when it was released into the arcades in 1982 by Sega. This unique, at the time, isometric shooter proved very popular. Its graphic look and hard gameplay won over many gamers. The game was released on many home systems including ColecoVision, Intellivision, Commodore, Atari and of course the Spectrum. The colourful 3D scrolling graphics would prove difficult to replicate on most systems, so how did the Spectrum get on? Released in 1985 by US Gold, the inlay didn't even show a Spectrum screenshot. Now why would that be? Onto the game then and the terrible beeping sound is accompanied by a nice looking loading screen. And now we know why there wasn't a screenshot. The game graphics look nothing like the arcade version. There's no floor or side walls, so it's very difficult to see where you are. There is a shadow, luckily, so you can just about judge your height, and there is a height meter at the bottom, however you're too busy trying not to crash to look at that.
Things move slowly and in jumps. No smooth scrolling here. The vertical walls look, well, fairly poor and basic really, but your laser does hit them, so you know if you're high enough to get over them. Diving down to hit the fuel, which you need, is dangerous, as there are missiles and gun turrets all over the place, and the 3D view of the game makes it sometimes impossible to judge your exact position. Another problem is when you die in the Spectrum version, you go right back to the start, unlike the arcade. Colour is badly used. They should have made it all monochrome, or at least made better use of the colour, to avoid colour clash, which there is quite a lot of, and it can make the game look messy. Sound is pretty bad really, just a few weak blips and bleeps here and there. Gameplay is, to be honest, not brilliant. Once you get used to the viewpoint, you can make a little progress into each level. I managed to get to the second level after about 20 minutes of trying, and once you know the route, you can plan to avoid anything dangerous. The second level has no ground, shadows or walls. It's in space, so trying to gauge how high you are is tricky indeed. The arcade version, your ship changed size, but on the Spectrum, it stays the same. After this comes the third level, and we see the difficulty ramped up here. There are small gaps in the walls you have to fly through, which is very, very difficult. In fact, I never made it. I suppose the developers did the best they could, but I'm not sure things have turned out well here. It sort of resembles the arcade, but it was always going to be troublesome. A game that promises so much then, but sadly doesn't deliver. It is playable if you stick with it and memorise the obstacles. But the 3D, the collision detection and the lack of visual clues as to your position make it a frustrating play. To see the end boss I use the RZX, and yes, that sums up the game quite well. This is Springbot Mars Attack, by Andrew Farrell, written in 2020. A mining facility is being taken over by evil aliens, and to get rid of them, you have to collect fuel cells to power the generator to create a huge explosion. This is a really nice looking platformer, created using AGDX, and the screens look bright and clean. Control is very good, and the game presents a decent challenge, unless of course you're me, who isn't very good at it. The sprites are well drawn and animated and move really smoothly, and overall this is a very polished game. Sound is used well for effects and background noises, and the level layout makes for a good experience. This is definitely one to try if you like games such as Jet Set Willy or Dynamite Dan. The author has also intimated he may make a 1 to 8k version with AY sound, which will make this already great game even better. So we're looking at questions that appeared on Twitter when I asked for questions for Let's Talk About. There were quite a few interesting ones, some we'd already done and some we hadn't. So let's kick off with uh, from Scott Hassler. How about debating uh, whether Sir Clive's push for a budget machine limited the Spectrum's scope? That's a good question. Well, it did. But haven't people argued that's an advantage? It was the simplicity of the hardware that 
made it powerful in a way. You had a processor, some memory, and nothing else, so you could do anything you wanted with it. It was yes, it was quite wide. It was quite open. You could do what you wanted, and I suppose people then were challenged to push it more. Yeah, so it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. It definitely limited it, though. It limited it because you had things like Color Clash, um, but at the same time, there were so many third-party companies that came up with add-ons to improve the sound and. Um, you got the ZX Max drive and the wafer drive, mm. and you, you had a whole host of things you could plug into the back of it that did extend it, but the core specifications with its eight colours and one channel beeper and everything did limit it. But um, I don't know, people did push it to its limits, I think, later on. It did, didn't it? Um, yeah, you didn't even have joystick ports, did you? I know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Actually, jo- no, think about the joystick ports. One thing yeah. about the joystick ports is. Yeah. Um, I really like using the keys for games, yes, and I, I remember C64, you couldn't always use the keys, could you? Some some games you could only use the joystick. Well, most of the machines that had joystick parts built in, the games were written because they assumed you'd have a joystick. Yeah. So, again, I think I think some of the things that we didn't get on the Spectrum because of the it was a budget machine were actually to its advantage. Yeah, and I, and I think, that obviously, it's, it's well documented that the price of the machine was responsible for its popularity yeah sir clive wasn't just interested in the in the micro market as well no he wasn't he really wanted to get into business machines but he never really yeah. did <laughs> and electronic ca- electric cars <laughs> <laughs> yes so yeah the, what, the one thing that limited the spectrum for future um development and expansion was almost certainly the c5 <laughs> So that's that done. What's our next Twitter question? Text adventures, but I know you hate them with a vengeance. So I don't. I don't hate them. I I, I just don't like a lot of them. Right. <laughs> I I've, I've been playing um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on my Spectrum Next. Ah, excellent. On the Z Machine emulator. It it is a very tricky game to get to to go. But before before we go any further, Mark Hardesty posted that question on Twitter. Thank you for that question. Text adventures. Yes, I love them, but I haven't got enough time to play them. And Jeff is experiencing Hitchhiker's Guide. Have you played it before on any of the format? Do you know? Nope. Uh, I, I had it on the Amiga and still have the original packaging with all the stuff in. And I couldn't get very far in it. I don't know. I just I, I enjoyed it, but I couldn't get very far in it. I, I managed I managed not to ask for a hint until I had to get the Babel fish. And that was so oh, difficult. Yes, I remember that. That's one of the classic um, getting challenges the, in that game. Getting the Babel fish is just... I mean, there's something like 15 hints to tell you how to get it. It just took me forever. <laughs> and I was thinking, no, no, I'm not going to ask for a hint. I've got this far without asking for a hint. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. But yeah, I, I'm really enjoying that. I can see why it was so popular at the time. You almost forget it hasn't got pictures in a strange way. If you get, if you really get into the story and it's told really well and the game is written really well, but you don't keep hitting dead ends and things, you can get really immersed in it. Yeah. And of course, always loved the Hobbit. Hobbit was great to play. Um, and Mad Martha, Mad Martha was a real favourite of mine. The Hobbit was good, I agree, and I always played Adventure One by Abasoft. That was mm. my favourite. But the later ones, I, I, I wish I'd got into things like the Pawn and Guild of Thieves, because they were out on the 16-bit machines, and they they got a Spectrum release. And I always wanted to get into those. But mm. as time went on, people just started packing more and more and more into into the Spectrum text adventures. Yeah, Snowball and Red Moon, and then they all sounded good. I played the. The Hulk and Spider-Man a little bit, mm. but I I didn't like them that much. They were a bit fiddly. <laughs> um, it's a, it's again we're talking limitations because the the Spectrum's memory limitations meant you had to compromise. You either had to have long descriptive text locations and very few puzzles and objects, or loads of puzzles and objects and and location descriptions of one line. Yeah, it got a, a lot better as the Spectrum got older. People got compression and things like that, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. So I think that ends the, the questions from Twitter. Thank you for all those people that, that posted on Twitter. If you've got any more suggestions, keep them coming. Mm. This is Frog 5 and Showdown, released in 1983 by Arctic Computing. Now this is a very early and very basic compilation of two very early arcade games, so don't be expecting too much here. Let's try Frog 5 first, and obviously this is going to be a version of Frogger. And yes it is, well, sort of, a very cut down version. 
All you have to do is guide your frog across a busy road and into his cage. Not sure why a frog is heading for a cage though. Unless the game name has been changed. You can break into this game and see the lovely listing if you want, and yes, it's written in BASIC. Back to the game then, and the car's moving 8 pixel jumps, as does the frog, called Fred by the way. And planning your route is tricky, especially as the key responses is terrible. The cage moves across the top of the screen, so you have to make sure that you can get to it, that is if you really care. Yes, the game is basic in every sense, so this is something not to be played again. Let's move on to Showdown then. And this is a version of an ancient arcade game called Gunfight. This can be a one or two player game, and the idea is to shoot the other cowboy before he shoots you. In one player mode, the computer controlled cowboy is way too fast, and the game doesn't last that long, and you get a lovely beeper death march. The graphics are large but moving character squares, and sound is non-existent really, apart from the terrible beeper tunes. This is not a fun game at all. I suppose it might be okay with two players, but that's about it. And yes, this is also basic, you can break into it and see the listing. This compilation is definitely one to keep away from then, as both games are terrible. Let's have a little catch up with the Spectrum next. Something that always looked promising on the next was the utility called RAMS. This is developed by Rusty Pixels and is, essentially, an arcade game emulator, a bit like MAME for the Spectrum next. When I first saw it on the Spectrum next game site, I couldn't wait to try it out. You obviously need the original arcade ROMs, and these need adding to pre-named folders on your SD card. There are only a few games that are working at the moment, and more are planned. Donkey Kong. Not a lot needs saying about this game. It's the arcade game. On the next. You can switch between several views, and you can have a full screen view, or a smaller cocktail view, or a rotated view if you really want. Pac-Man is a good example of the different screen layouts too. You can even have one that's larger than the screen that scrolls, although I'm not too keen on this one to be honest. On to Galaxian. And again it's great to play this on the next and it looks brilliant. The sound for me doesn't seem 100% accurate, but it may be because I'm running it through HDMI, or that the next just doesn't have the same sound capabilities or chips as the arcade. They're only very slight and you probably wouldn't notice them, either that or I'm getting too old. Looking at the main menu, it seems like the next games heading our way are Frogger and Mooncrester, which will be brilliant. If you have a next, get this. It's really good, and another brilliant job by Rusty Pixels. <laughs> 